Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Comic Book Users. Welcome to another episode of the show. It's inside the cover once again. We're doing another Warren magazine here. Great stuff from the 60s and 70s. This is Eerie, issue number 46. And yes, that is Count Dracula on the cover. How spectacular is that, right? 76 pages of terror and suspense. The Bloodlust of Dracula rises again on page 6. This is a great issue. This is one of my favorite issues uh, that I've read so far of the great Eerie Warren Publishing. This is from 1972, right? That great cover is by San Julian. Okay. Uh, speaking of Dracula, so we've got a little opening here of a Portrait of Dracula, which gives a little bit of the history of the actual... Uh, Vlad Dracula character, right? And then the back kind of finishes that off, right? Right, right there. Okay, but oops, got a, got a preview of the, the very last page. Didn't mean to do that. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, editor and publisher James Warren, managing editor W.B. Dubay, cover San Julian, like I mentioned, production Bill Mahalley, uh, artist in this issue, Reed Crandall, Jimmy Janes, Esteban Moroto, Paul Neary, Martin Salvador, and Tom Sutton. Uh, marketing director Flo Steinberg. Writers this issue Jerry Boudreau, Dubé, Mike Jennings, Fred Ott, Esteban Moroto, and Bill Warren. Then we got a whole bunch of stories. So there's your, uh, your opening page, your kind of table of contents, right? Again, it's 1973. Uh, opens up on the first page. We've got the uh, readers' letters page, you know. Very cool. And then we get uh, Dracula story. So apparently right around this time in Erie, we had a whole bunch of cool Dracula stories. So I'm assuming this sounds like I'm trying to think what the years were where Marvel was doing uh, Tomb of Dracula, whether this was right at the same time or before or after. I don't quite remember. Uh, I'd have to go back and look at some of the dates. But uh, again, this particular story kind of uh, got its genesis in Vampirella, which of course is another Warren magazine. So we had Vampirella and Dracula in Vampirella magazine. What is that? 18, 19, 20, 16, 18, 19, 21 issues of Vampirella. So here we've got Dracula and Vampirella and this other uh, entity known as the Conjurus, an immortal ent entity known as the Conjurus. So basically what they're talking about here is that in this story, Okay, in this tale, uh, Dracula fully realizes the extent of his evilness and what he does, right? But he's got some kind of conscience and he feels really bad about taking lives and he wants to be cured, he wants to be changed, doesn't want to go through life this way. So he's hanging with Vampirella and the Conjurist and they're trying to figure it all out. But the Conjurist basically says, we need to send Vampirella and the Van Helsings back to their own time and we are going to go somewhere where you can live out the rest of your life in a place that's even more depraved as you so you can deal with this whole affliction that you have, right? So you basically, so he's like, well, where are you going to take me? Where are you going to take me? Vampirella and the, and the Van Helsings go away. They're out of the story. And the Conjurist takes him to the Barbary Coast of the early 1900s. Barbary Coast, of course, California, right? Goes back in time to the early 1900s at a time of just all sorts of ridiculous stuff going on there. And Dracula finds he's amidst all these people that are just as bad and evil as he is, right? But here, of course, his bloodlust comes upon him. He feels bad for what he's got to do, but, you know, he's he's Dracula, right? So as the story goes on, he, you know, he goes, I can't stay in this Barbary Coast place. I need to leave. I need to figure out how to get the hell out of here, right? And he comes upon uh, here, but then we see this uh, young woman prostitute, and she's basically luring men to a place, right? And then this out of nowhere comes this old hag, this witch woman, and basically what she's doing is she is working with the prostitute to bring men to her so she can kill them, and then she eats their hearts so she can kind of stay alive, right? So as this is all going on, uh, Dracula has figured out a way to procure a spot on a ship to take him back to his homeland, but of course he's got to go find a, uh, a coffin, right? Because he's got to be able to hide on the ship, right? So he goes, so he kills a couple guys, and he basically he takes them under his power, and he's like, you got to go out and find me a coffin, but he starts walking around, and of course he runs into the prostitute, and she sees him, and like, oh, there's, there's another victim, right? So he wants to, like, obviously bite her and get some blood, but of course... Uh, 
the witch woman comes in. And at the same time as the witch woman comes in, the conjurer shows up again. The witch woman goes to hit Dracula. The conjurer steps in and the witch woman nails the conjurer over the head. So now, of course, uh, Dracula is its like the only being or whatever that he actually cared for. So he, of course, is distraught. And then he's like, I'm going to kill you, witch woman, and I'm going to kill the prostitute. At the same time that all this happens, all of a sudden an earthquake hits the San Francisco area. So he's like, crap, we got to get out of here. So he grabs the conjurus, the witch woman, and the prostitute, brings them onto the ship. The ship takes off. Okay, while while the horrible earthquake is happening in Cal in San Francisco, people are dying left and right, but they're on the ship out to the water. So they're out in the crazy sea. And they say here the second the epilogue and an immortal died, right? Because of course now that the conjurus is dead, he is going to make those Yeah, they're with me. The uh, the he's gonna make those two pay, of course, for what they have done. And that's where it kind of ends, and basically in the next issue. We will see the conclusion of that story. So that will be issue number 47, right? So here, the next story is called The Things in the Dark. And this is a story that starts out about a bunch of kids who are going at night into a cemetery. Of course, they shouldn't be there. One of them goes missing. A bunch of them go missing. And then, of course, the uh, the caretaker then is telling the story of uh, brings in, asks a professor to come to the cemetery and he's like, this is what happened. These kids are hanging out here and then they they all disappeared. And I don't know what happened. I'm just a caretaker. I got no life, got no friends. I just basically work and live in my little uh, little place here. So, um, <laughs> and uh, so the professor is there. Sorry, my wife just came into the room. Um, and uh, the professor is basically, you know, there to do a little research and find out what's going on here. So they go snooping around the cemetery. They start to see all of these kind of strange apparitions and things, but then they see these like holes, these tunnels, which like lead into into the ground and go like underneath where the graves are and stuff like that. So they find one coffin that has been like broken into, like ripped into, and they open it up. And inside the coffin is this giant, like kind of like almost like caterpillar worm type of thing, but it's dead. So the, so somehow that thing got into one of the uh, the coffins and just ate the, uh, the corpse and then died. So they find all these other holes and tunnels and they decide to go underground and as they do, they find all sorts of dead bodies and things happening. So the professor is like, and now he's like, oh, we have to solve this. We have to find out what's going on. You know, there's probably more of these creatures and whatnot. So then he turns around and the caretaker is gone. He went back up top. What does he do? He's back up top and he is burying the professor down in one of these tunnels. Okay. And then as the professor guy turns around he finds all sorts of these caterpillar creatures these worms coming after him and attacking him as it turns out the caretaker guy basically has been has befriended all of these creatures he's got no friends so that he's like now they're like his pets and he basically the, he has let all the caterpillar creatures eat all of the corpses that have been buried there with no new food he has been now bringing people into the cemetery, hence the kids and whatnot. So he's just basically bringing the caterpillars, his new friends, uh, all sorts of dinner each and every day. So that's that particular story. Then you've got uh, the critics, Crypt, all right? So basically you got a review of some Star Trek books back at the time, so the early 70s, they had the little novellas, right? Then you got a story called Garganza. This is like a Kayachu story about obviously uh, as i go through this you'll think god this is a complete ripoff of godzilla and you would be correct all right garganza is this giant dinosaur type creature who is attacking off tokyo people of japan don't know what's going on they're doing all sorts of research it looks like it's a giant dinosaur right um so as the, the army gets involved the military they're trying to fight off this gigantic Dinosaur creature who also spews fire or whatnot. Nothing they do can beat it. Tanks get destroyed. Everything gets destroyed. It's like, oh my god, there's no way we can fight off Garganza. Right? Then they find out that Garganza, as it's destroying towns and cities, goes and lays eggs. The eggs hatch. They turn into little, smaller Garganzas. They start to destroy the world. And before you know it, there are all sorts of giant 
dinosaurs once again on the earth and the people, the dinosaurs command the world, people are gone. But then as the epilogue of the story, evolution happens, man creatures are back on the earth, they start to evolve, they build back cities, and then atomic bombs fall, all that kind of stuff, and then we're back to the beginning with two fishermen who notice a creature coming up from the bomb. So it's like history just repeats itself and it's like one long evolutionary thing. So here you get back issues. Oh, here, love the ad. the ads is basically all this kind of cool stuff. Here we got uh, the root of evil is the next story. So here we got a story about how a kind of like a guy hard on his luck, kind of like a bum, gets a word of a job offering somewhere. He goes to interview for the job, and it's like this kind of nerdy professor type of guy who's kind of kind of looks bizarre. He's like kind of like a humpback and short, and he's got a very young assistant working for him. So the bum goes, signs up for the job. It's like, yes, we got a job. It's going to involve some experiments, but you're going to live here. You'll do some work for us and whatnot. And they, they give him alcohol and, he, you know, lots of alcohol and food. They give him a place to, to sleep, and he's drinking up a storm and passing out and waking up. And as it turns out, like days have gone by, and they're like, well, what's actually been going on? It's like, oh, we've been doing experiments on you. And he, you know, he wakes up every every couple of days, and, you know, the young assistant starts to, you know, feel kind of sorry for him. And But meanwhile, the, uh, the, 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 uh, scientist guy he's got the hots for her she wants nothing to do with him so the days and weeks go by and all of a sudden the the uh, the bum guy is starting to look better and he's doesn't feel like he hasn't been drinking at all and he's just been sleeping and experimenting at the but next to his bed is like this rose bush and he hates the rose bush he hates the smell of it and he's like he tries to cover it up right but at one point after a few days he goes to take the cover off of it and he notices that the rose bush is now kind of shaped like a man and he's got all sorts of branches and things grown off of his skin. So what's actually been what happening is the, the scientists have been doing some kind of transplant between the plant and him. And so now the plant is turning into a human. He's turning into a plant. So there's like this whole reverse thing going on, which is kind of crazy, but kind of cool. And then, of course, you know, she takes his side and she feels bad for him. And does, and she's, she's like, oh, I can't believe my boss is doing this stuff. And... Uh, so now the the outside world he, he goes the, 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 he, he as a plant goes out starts attacking people she meanwhile you know sees what's going on she's like we have to we have to fix this we have to fix this and now the plant man that he's created attacks him and kills him so she then goes to kill the creation and that kills the guy so now they both die in the story right so all that for nothing right crazy Planet of the Werewolves. It's a little kind of dark in here. Hold on. Uh, here we go. So here we got Planet of the Werewolves. People on a ship. They have to emergency land on a planet. They don't know what's going on with the planet, but they see like these strange creatures and a guy out there walking around. It's like, obviously, can breathe the air there. So they rescue him and... Uh, drive off the werewolf creatures with a little bright light and he basically says you know i was also stranded on this planet all my fellow uh you know member of employees and whatnot they were they were killed by these werewolves but i've just been able to escape them but every day you know i have to night at night time i have to you know hide from them and whatnot they apparently the there was a whole other race of people on here and the werewolves killed them all off and there's not that many of them left so now it's like this whole thing of survival so uh, at one point, uh, half of the crew, the two guys on the crew, are going to go out exploring a little bit. So they leave the guy they rescued, as well as the female crew member, on board. When they come back, they notice that the uh, the hull of the ship has been breached. And they go in, they find her dead with her throat slashed. And in the other room is the other dude. And he says, yeah, they came in, they attacked. Um, I, I barely got away. They killed her or whatnot. So then the, the werewolf creatures come onto the ship, right? They try to fight them off, which they do. So then they're like, all right, we've got to get out of here. We think we've got the ship fixed. So they get ready to, to take off, and he's meanwhile the guy they rescued is all sorts of excited. He can finally go back to Earth, right? But then they realize that the guy is now part of the race that was actually called the Hujiri, part of the race that were killed off, that race of people were vampires. So it was basically vampires and werewolves left on the planet. He is the only last remaining member of the vampire 
race in there. They're going back to Earth. So he basically said, you are going to take me back. Either I can kill you right now, or you're going to take me back to Earth where I can have my way with society and, and begin a new race of vampires. So that's kind of where this story ends, right? So here we've got the exciting new art, comic art, Dracula art. Right now it's all sorts of cool... As you know, most of these war magazines, you've got all sorts of cool ads for all sorts of stuff, masks and books and posters and movies, 8mm home movies, hardcover books, magazines, uh, what do you call it, models, toys, all sorts of stuff. There you go. Home movies, look at all these awesome things there. Very, very cool. And then we've got uh, some little article pieces here. And then last but not least, you got one more story. So this is called Dax the Warrior the Giant. This is kind of like a Conan the Barbera thing. So here you got like this centaur creature attacking this uh, naked lady, naked maiden, right? And she... It's rescued by this warrior, Dax the Warrior. So he comes in, kills, steals these other creatures that are after her, and of course they wind up doing the you-know-what, right? So she decides to go with him in his quest. Of course, she has got no clothes on, so for all you folks who are a little young, nudity. Uh, so then creatures come out after them, right? He fights them off, but they actually wind up killing her. So he goes and brings her back for a burial, and he meets up with this kind of like magician kind of guy. Nuka, stop. And uh, then the, the the Cyclops comes back in. So the magician basically says, I need someone to take over for me here. I am the master and ruler of all the creatures. I am, at my time has expired. I want you to take over. And Dax is like, hell no, I don't want to do that. I have no interest in doing that. He goes, well, then if you won't take this job, this role, then you need to fight the the, uh, the Cyclops and you're going to be killed, right? Because he's like five times the size of you. So he's like, okay. So he gets manhandled for a bit. But then he says, you know what? I'm faster. I'm smarter than he is. I've got a knife. I'm going to figure this out. So what does he do? He uses his, his noggin. He winds up slicing him at the heel cutting his leg, jumping on top of him, killing him, slicing his head off. So basically the magician uh, is like amazed. I can't believe you did this, you know, whatever. And so what does he do? He goes and kills the magician, but then he is immediately then becomes the master of the monsters because he actually did what he, what the magician wanted him to do. So there you have it. Good stuff. All cool monster and horror stories in this one. Uh, really interesting stories, and man, that cover is amazing. Always, it's always good to have Dracula in, right? So, you know, in the back, a preview of the next issue. More Dracula, more of the cool stuff. There you have it. Thanks for watching. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't already, and click on that notification bell to so get alerted of all of our content as it posts. And please do hit the like button before you leave. Also, down below, we get the links to our Ko-Fi page for uh, channel donations as well as our merch page. No, I always say that. That's the Sea of Tranquility thing. Anyway, never mind. You guys, for those of you who watch and watch me on Sea of Tranquility, you know I kind of say the same spiel at the end of every episode, so I'm just kind of like rattling along. So anyway, uh, yeah, uh, we do have uh, the links to the Sea of Tranquility merch page where you can get a comic book geezer's uh, t-shirt or coffee mug. That is below. That is below. Uh, so thanks in advance for all that, and uh, hope you like this issue of Eerie, number, what did I say, number 46? Let us know if you've ever read this one. If it's something you're looking to get, you can get this out there in the wild. These are all fairly inexpensive. You get them in great condition. This is amazing for a book that's like, you know, 50 years old. It's amazing. So anyway, thanks for watching. We'll see you soon on here. Comic Book Geezer with more stuff. I am P. Parle. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.